taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. I wonder how many of you can remember that particular anxiety of being responsible for a child who has just started crawling. It's not just where they might scoot off to or what they might pull down from your shelves or which sockets they might stick their drooly fingers into. It's also what they might find on the floor and put right into their mouths. Because babies put everything into their mouths. There's a period where parents become very familiar with that move of sweeping through the mouth, checking to see what it was the child found on the floor, a Lego or dog poop or <laughs> cookies. Let's hope it was cookies. For a while, caregivers have to live with a hyper-awareness of what is on the floor that might end up in the mouth. Babies don't have to be taught to be curious or to be hungry, but they do need a little help learning which things are good to put in your mouth as they move from the intimacy of milk to trying bits of avocado or peach from their parents' plates. Of course, for me, it was milk and then rice cereal. You remember that powder that came in a cardboard box and tastes kind of like cardboard? I wish I could remember the first, my first taste of something new and delicious as a child, but that memory is lost. My husband, though, his very earliest memory is a memory of food. He remembers being on his grandparents' back porch in North Georgia, eating some fish that they had just caught that day from their lake, and he's sitting in a high chair, so this was an early memory, but he remembers dipping the fish in the ketchup and eating it and looking across at his family and the light reflecting off the swimming pool. And isn't that a joyous scene? What a great first memory. I remember being so hungry after church. <laughs> and in my church, we did not have donuts. So... I remember being so hungry after church, and I was growing up in San Antonio, and our favorite thing to do after church was to go eat lunch at the Alamo Cafe. And at the Alamo Cafe, they bring out chips and salsa, sure, but that was not enough. They also bring out fresh tortillas to your table. And somebody taught me to take the little butter pat from the middle of the table and spread it on my warm tortilla and then take the little sugar packet meant for your iced tea and spread that on my tortilla and roll it up. And I had a little cinnamon roll. <laughs> That's a good memory too. I'm very grateful to whoever it was who taught me that trick. Babies don't need to be taught to be hungry but they do need some help learning what's good to eat. And maybe we do too. We need someone to teach us how to roll the tortillas or to let us nibble off their plates when we're not sure if we'll like something. We need people who teach us how to mix water and salt and yeast and flour and how to recognize by feel how warm the water needs to be and what the yeast smells like as it bubbles up people who will teach us how to knead the dough and be able to tell when it's just elastic enough to rest and when it's risen enough to bake. We need that kind of knowledge that's embodied, that's passed not from brain to brain, but from hand to hand, the record of it living not just on paper, but in our noses and our bellies. Some of it's on paper, too. A couple of weeks ago, I pulled a recipe out of my files um, a recipe that came from my mother's kitchen, a recipe for chimichangas. And she had written on this recipe, September 1985, VG. That's very good in our family code. <laughs> I snapped a picture of this recipe and sent it to my family text thread, uh, you know, unwillingly igniting a controversy that lasted for quite a while because Apparently, my sister hated the chimichangas. <laughs> so we spent some time texting back and forth about which of mom's recipes were the best. And 
You know, maybe we also need people to argue with about what tastes good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. On this All Saints Day, we're here together in part to remember those people who let us nibble off their plates, who helped us learn to appreciate new tastes, the people who taught us to stir the butter and the milk and that bright orange powder together with the macaroni noodles. <laughs> the people who argued with us about what tasted good. The people who kept the dust balls and the marbles off of the floor so we wouldn't choke. I mean, of course, the people who have given us those first bites from scripture that made us hungry for more. The ones who helped us move past addiction to what was toxic to learn to savor some new tastes. The people who took us under their wings as we learned to feed the hungry and visit the imprisoned and clothe the naked and do the things Jesus told us to do. Some of these people are people we have never met. We've read the stories of St. Francis and St. Pauli Murray and so many others and their stories helped us taste God's goodness. But some of the saints we have met, and some of them are here in this room. We don't need to be taught hunger, but sometimes we do need help learning to hunger for the right things, the things that are good. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus says. I don't think Jesus means that we're blessed if we are good little goody two-shoes who always obey the rules. I think Jesus means we are blessed if we hunger for wrongs to be made right again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for wrongs to be made right. If we look at the world and we see clearly the grief and the suffering, and the injustice, and the reality of that is always growling within us like an empty stomach, always reminding us to do something, or at least to cry out to God to make it right, to cry out to God to fill the hungry and the empty with good things. Then we will be blessed. Then we will be children of God. Because ultimately, nothing less than righteousness, things made right, will fill our bellies and satisfy our hungers. That's what we were created for. And it's what one day we will find. The promise of Revelation we just read, that one day we will hunger and thirst no more. I take this as a promise about this particular hunger and thirst for righteousness. One day we won't have to cry out to God to make things right because everything will have been made new. But until then, we keep tasting God and we keep hungering for more of God's righteousness, for more wrongs to be made right. And tasting that goodness of God, that's what we're about to do here at this table. And it's what we help each other do as a communion of saints. We help each other learn to hunger rightly. There's this beautiful old Hasidic story about the difference between heaven and hell. And I don't think this is a story that's supposed to actually be giving us a vision of the afterlife, but it's a story that helps us understand how to live now. In hell, the story says, we're all seated at a table and everyone's starving because their arms can't reach the food. And in heaven, we're all seated at the same table and we're spooning the best morsels onto each other's plates. And we're holding out forkfuls of tiramisu and apple pie for each other to taste. Heaven is the world where everyone has enough and everyone is satisfied. And that's the world the saints are teaching us to live in and to work for. It's the world we're teaching each other to live in and to work for. 
Today, we are welcoming a new member into the household of God, the communion of saints. And as we reaffirm our baptismal vows in just a moment, I invite you to think of those who taught you to taste the goodness of God and to consider how you can let little George and all those in your life nibble off your plate and taste and see that God is good. And now I invite you to stand for hymn 294.